Hey guys, I just wanted to do a short video and talk about the LDA head that I've developed because um, I thought some people may find it interesting. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the status bar that you that you see. So that there and that there is a little bar, a little object that I wrote, um, which is this project here it's a fairly simple project actually um so it's literally just a windows control user control um it's got various properties so you've got a maximum a minimum and a value uh, and you can also set the colors which is why you say it's exactly the same so for the health bar for LBA1, health gives me 0 to 50. For LBA2, it's 0 to 255. And your magic bar um, for LBA1 and 2 goes from 0 when your magic level is 0 to 80 when you have magic level 4 because you get 20 magic points per level. Um, let me bring this back that's kind of all this really does it overrides the on paint method um, um yeah and it also you have the option although i have it turned off we change one of the properties uh, I feel like I'm developing the screen to sh display value. And that should, when it repaints, should repaint automatic. There we go. So it's showing that that's currently set to 50. And if we do the same, that one. So it's currently 70 magic points allocated to that. Um, Let's just go and change those back. So that is a feature I added in that I didn't end up using. But I've left it in there because it's a fairly generic object. You can change the colors of it. So it's something I might use in the future and it might be nice to have the little progress on there. Um, but that custom draws and the text is custom rendered as well. It measures out the text, allocates the height and width and the locations and stuff. So it's always centered, no matter how big the controller is. Um, so that's that project. That's fairly simple. There's not a lot to it. Uh, I don't want to save that. Okay. So then we come to the head object itself. This is where the majority of the code this project Pacific code is. Um, so we'll go through it. I can't really remember this, even though I only wrote it yesterday. Uh, that is the wrong project. <laughs> the, that's the one I wanted. <laughs> yeah, smooth. Um, so we have module variables for all the different things that we're tracking. Uh, so we've got the health, magic level, magic points, keys, clover boxes, clovers, caches, zolitos, and also that should be a constant, but that's just the maximum width magic bar go to. Um, so there exposes properties, which allows me to trigger stuff when it's fired. So health is fairly simple. It just sets the value of the health bar. Um, which we were talking about a minute ago to your current health value and then the health bar itself will I shouldn't have closed it actually uh, I forgot to talk about how it works best video I've ever done this seamless transitions Just reload this I look all prepared uh, so yeah it calculates it uses two rectangles placed side by side and it calculates the width of the color so like how full it is um, and then I think the yeah the other one I think is just always rendered at the 
and it is. So your fill rectangle, so like the empty this is always the entire width and then the color just kind of uh, does that so like it doesn't always cover so this is kind of revealed in, like the lower so your healthy your magic is the more of the underline you can see so yeah that's that <laughs> close that again we're not gonna use that again for another 30 seconds <laughs> um right um so most of this is fairly fairly generic there's not a lot going on to be honest i don't know why it took me so long to code it uh, magic level is kind of complex relatively speaking but not really um so it dynamically sets the maximum of the bar based on your magic level which is zero to four uh, multiplied by 20 and then the width is calculated after the width what are we calculating that based on oh we're calculating the width of that based on yeah the magic level as well so that's where it grows and shrinks because otherwise the underlying object would allow you just to change the maximum and value and then the slider would just kind of move so this is why it resizes automatically uh, magic points like just literally just sets the value um because that's just zero to four um what else keys again that literally just sets the text box doesn't do anything at all remotely interesting uh what else have we got blah 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 clover boxes clover boxes i guess has some code going on uh we should probably talk about this um so this automatically what does it do how like I did this about three ways and then ended up doing like this. Um, we just look at the code and work out what I did and then explain what I did by looking at the code. <laughs> uh, so we've got a clover box array, I believe. Yeah, we've got a clover box array of 10 pixel boxes. Um, it's almost like I didn't write this. <laughs> like literally yesterday. I've been to work all day. That's my excuse. Um, so we, what are we doing? Ah, so the first thing we do in the initial clothing box load, we automatically populate all the clothing boxes relative to the current clover count and the clover box count. Um, so basically for every clover it assigns full clover box which is an image so that's where you see the full clover box and then for the remainder so you can have one clover then nine empty clover boxes it just sets the image to the empty one uh, and then it also sets them all initially everything gets set to invisible so visible is false and then for visible it sets so for every clover box you have it sets that clover box to visible so they're all there all 10 of them are there the whole time you just can't always see them so when the update function is called uh it automatically checks so this update function is called whenever clover box is updated or clovers is updated um i think Oh, that's how I did it. That's only clover boxes. Uh, I really should have looked over the code before I started talking about it. <laughs> yeah, update clovers. They're both calling update clovers. Um, which is what I thought they were doing. Uh, oh, yeah, it's just this right here. So for every clover box. Um, 
So until we hit a clover amount, we set the image to full. After that, we set it to empty. So that does the adding and removing of clovers. And then we also set the visible property to true. And then, so that does that for every clover box you have. And then it sets the rest of them to invisible. So you could potentially adjust it so you lose the clover box. You can never actually lose a clover box from within the game itself. Um, but like say you use the LBA trainer, as written by me, and remove some clover boxes, they would disappear from the HUD. Uh, refresh. Refresh is this little function here. Uh, I should probably free that manually in. So this, so all the functions are callback functions and offsets. So we've got offset arrays here. Um, so for magic level, etc. So it detects which version the game is running. There's a memory module, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that has a function to detect the LBA version. And then depending on which LBA version is running, it sets the offsets automatically. And that uses this code module I've written. So this is basically a code module. It's fairly simple. It's got an item list of functions. Um, so you can add stuff to it. Uh, what have we got? My mouse disappeared too. Uh, so you, to add something, you give it the function name, uh, the memory offset you want to add, and then how big it is in memory. So one byte, two byte, three bytes. And then this fires every 50 milliseconds. By default, you can change the interval. Uh, where am I looking? Uh, and then for every item in the array, it calls the function every 50 milliseconds. Say so this is the current value, this is the current value, this is the current value. Um, and that's how the update functions get called. So that's firing for 50 milliseconds for each function. I could probably change that to 100 milliseconds to be fair to slow it down a little bit. Um, the other thing, initially I had the HUD, so this is just a, another Windows object. So initially I just dumped that on a form, and then you got the ugly kind of like bar at the top of the window that allows you to pick it up and move it around. Uh, but then I got rid of that, which meant you didn't have an X button to click to close it. So instead, I added it in, so if you click on the magic pixel box, so the little magic vial, it triggers that and the app exits. Uh, also, there was an issue where if you loaded the HUD before you loaded LBA, it wouldn't work. It automatically tries to detect it and then fails to detect the game running and then did nothing. So if you load the head before you load the game, you can click on the little heart. I like to reload, if you reload everything, sort it all out. So that's kind of that. And um, there's not a lot of code to talk about. Oh, I mentioned the memory module. So yeah, this is something I wrote and I use this for all the memory handling for all my projects for LBA. This was a bit of a hack. I originally wrote this when I was writing the auto splitter for speedrunning LBA1. Um, one of the issues with coding for DOSBox is trying to get a pointer path, um, which you can do. It's just a pain in the neck because you have to find the DOSBox route and then the route of the emulation. And then different DOSBox versions will emulate the game in a different place. So to work around that, so it just magically works for all DOSBox versions, it gets a base address. 
Uh, basically, what get base address does, it looks for a string in memory. Um, and then from that known memory location, everything else is offset from that. Um, so for LBA1, there's a string that we search for, which is temper.temper. And then when we find that, all the offsets we use are offset from that that value in memory. Um, so that's why it works for all DOSBox versions without having to be specifically modified for each DOSBox version. Uh, and this has, because when you're trying to read and write for process memory, you have to pinvoke um, call to like native libraries, which is fine, but this just abstracts it all. So rather than having to open a process and read mem process memory and give it 20 different values, I can just in the actual code, uh, which is the wrong project. Actually, I think we are doing this. Um, I love that I'm talking to myself when I'm meant to be explaining things. The one memory value I had to search that was new to the project was, If we're on Twinson, we good definition. So yeah, this uses the memory object to detect the LBA version. Uh, because if we're on LBA one, we don't need to detect if we're on Twinson or if we're on Steelish, because we're always on Twinson. Um, but yeah, so we've got a read address function here. So that gets me ooh. my brain is not working. Um does that need to be there? Yeah. Um so this basically reads that memory value. And that could also be simplified to get val as well. But yeah, so there's quite a few helper functions that save me having to call these functions all the time so it's just basically an abstraction layer that says a lot of code and it's nice and reusable uh, so I think that's pretty much everything there and this here this is the simplest layer of all uh, I can get rid of that actually no it's fine uh, so this has a couple of little functions. This is all the code for the actual XE. Most of the code is in the underlying objects. So this has code to allow you to move it around. So if you hold the mouse button down, it'll move it. Um, and it also has code to keep it on top. So if we run this, you can see I can pick it up and move it without having to have a bar at the top there. Which means it sits very nicely over the top of the game. And we just go in game. So we've got 28 caches, we've got no clavers, magic is about right, and health is about right. So we can just, uh, me load my LBA trainer actually. So this LBA trainer, this reads memory directly. So I can just so if say for instance in the game we die or we manually use a clover, you can see it updating the interface. So the health bar is now full. A clover is gone. We can also give ourselves less health. Change our market value, and we see it's all updating in real time. And let's just give ourselves some more money. And then, if we say go to the shop and buy something, uh, we'll buy a mecha penguin, a famous mecha penguin. I'll buy. 
you can see that's updated on the screen and caches has gone to 52. One thing I didn't talk about, because I'm forgetful like that. Oh, yeah, so we can reload, which you only need to do if it bugs up at the start. And you can exit by clicking Matthew Viral. That closes that. So minimize that. Uh, reload the object code again. I loaded, I went to the function and then did nothing with it. Uh, that definition. So we've got a function here, like I said earlier, that returns whether we're on TwinSim or whether we're on Zealish. And then that function is used to determine which pixel box we show, whether we show the pixel box on the caches or the picture box of the Zolitos. And then also which value we use, whether we use the value of caches or we use the value of Zolitos. Um, yeah, and that's kind of all there is to it. Um, and it works exactly the same for LBA1 as it does for LBA2. There's not a lot of difference. Um, the code, yeah, because the only difference is which offsets it uses to read from because it's just, yeah, and that's kind of a really bad show and tell that I should have practiced and should have prepared more. But <laughs> so I hope some of you found that interesting. Any questions, just ask. Thank you for watching.